In this lecture, we'll be looking at Chapter 14, Late Medieval Italy. Um, I want to start by apologizing. I have a little bit of a cold as I record this, so excuse me if I'm a little nas more nasally than normal. Um, what we're going to be looking at in this chapter, this is a little bit before the Renaissance started. So where we are is we're ending the Middle Ages, and then we're shifting into the Renaissance. We are going to be focusing on what's called the Ducento, which is 1200 to 1300, and the Trecento, which is 1300 to 1400. Now, the reason why we look at this time period is because um, art historians have argued whether this is actually the end of medieval times or if it should be considered the beginning of the Renaissance. Regardless, we're going to start seeing some of these uh, changes from medieval art into Renaissance art. And so it is considered a great turning point in Western art. What you see here, this is Giotto's Arita Chapel, or the Scrivini Chapel, 1305 to 1306. Um, the interior of this chapel consists of 38 framed panels that show the life of Mary and the life of Jesus. And what we're going to be looking at within this lecture is that we're going to see a shift from the medieval into um, more of an interest in individualism and artists wanting to accurately represent the natural world. Now, this is a new way of seeing, and it's a shift from the medieval focus and message on usually religion and not realism. What we're going to start to see is we're going to start to see a slight turning away from the spiritual world and more of a focus on the natural world. Now, we'll talk more about Giotto and the Arena Chapel a little bit later, but the reason the chapter starts with this is that Giotto, the artist, is often given credit as or for being one of the first artists to start this shift. Now, a little bit of background. So we're coming out of the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages was a time period um, from the fall of the Western Roman Empire until about the Renaissance. It was about 1,000 to 1,200 years. Now, interestingly enough, it got its name, the Middle Ages, from the people in the Renaissance, because the Renaissance is a time of rebirth and it's rebirth of the ideas of classical Greece and Rome. And what happens in the Renaissance is the people see the time period of the Middle Ages, which was heavily dominated by the church, as this kind of middle time where nothing really important happened. And that's not exactly fair. We are going to see things of importance that happen. But again, in the Middle Ages, the church dominated most of existence. In the Middle Ages, the focus was on religious life, and in fact, most people saw their existence on earth as this veil of tears that just must be endured, and you must endure it with the ultimate goal of reaching salvation in the afterlife. In the Middle Ages, most of the art is unnatural because the importance wasn't on showing the world realistically as it was, but the importance was on the religious message contained within the work. Also interesting is usually the role of the artist. We don't even know who many of the Middle Age artists were because they weren't seen as the ones creating the work. Artworks were seen as divinely inspired, and the artist was more just the technician who could physically create the work. Well, what's going to happen once we get into the Renaissance is we're going to see this shift, and we're going to see this shift to a focus on individualism and on representing the world as it realistically is. All right, and a little side note before we continue. In your textbook, you're going to have the chapters, and then there's little side notes or what I call sidebars where the text is giving you some additional information. Now, you are responsible for the information in these, regardless if we discuss them or not. However, there is um, a couple in this chapter I'm going to talk about, and the first is the Art and Society Italian Artist Names. For this chapter and the next couple, we are going to be focusing mainly on Italian art. Now, the names of artists, you may sometimes realize that they change a little bit. Um, so they're, sometimes they're called different things. And you have to remember how people were named at this time period usually their names would be linked to where they were from. So, for example, Nicola Pisano is Nicholas the Pisan, meaning he was from Pisa. Leonardo da Vinci, it's Leonard from Vinci. Vinci is a town near Florence. So that's where we get many of these names. That's why a lot of times we refer to some of the famous artists just by their first names, Michelangelo. 
And then a lot of times they, um, some artists would have nicknames, like Gudio di Pietro, who was known as Fra, Fra Angelica, which is the angelic friar. And so we also sometimes have the older, the younger, Hans Holbein, the younger, which means there was a Hans Holbein the older. Now this does not necessarily mean that they were related. Some of these nicknames, as it states in your book, could refer to big or small, like there was Big Thomas and Little Thomas. So just be aware that sometimes these names might be slightly different and don't let that flexibility throw you. Also, the same can be said for some of the titles of the works. Some of these, or a lot of these works, are altarpieces, and so they might not have a specific name. They're just known as the altarpiece from a specific region. So if you see names slightly different in um, different texts or just referred to differently, that's fine because it's not going to be until a little bit later where we're going to see the tradition of making sure works have a title. All right, well now let's go ahead and we're going to move on to the Ducento, which is the 13th century. And don't forget when you're talking about 13th century, that's 1200 to 1300. And what we're going to see at this time most artworks are still focused around religion and focused around the church. The church is one of the main patrons of the arts, meaning they are the ones that paid for it. And usually this artwork is created to adorn and decorate the churches and the cathedrals. And we see that such as in the work here. This is Giovanni Pisano's. This is the pulpit of the cathedral in Pisa, Italy. Now this work is over 15 feet high. And what this is, what the pulpit is, is this is where the priests would actually climb up and you can see the bird that's sticking out. That's actually a book holder. So he would place the text there and this is where he would preach from. Now what we're going to focus on is we are going to focus on the friezes, which are the relief sculptures, which go around the top of the pulpit. And we're going to focus on two that are seen here. The first one in the top left is actually, is actually Nicola Pisanos, and he was active from around 1258 to 1278. Um, again, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, this Nicola Pisano means from Pisa. So he settled in Pisa, and he specialized in carving the stone pulpits, which were again the raised platforms from which priests would deliver sermons. And what we see here is one of the friezes from the pulpit in the Pia and Pisa's old baptistry. And this is the Annunciation, Nativity, and Adoration of the Shepherds, 1259 to 1260 marble. And this is 2 feet 10 inches by 3 feet 9 inches. Now when we look at this, we can see, again, there's three different scenes in one panel. Okay, we see the Annunciation, which is Mary is told by the angel Gabriel that she's going to have um, the Son of God. Uh, the Nativity is where she is given birth and then the adoration of the shepherds. So what happens here is what we see is Mary does appear more lifelike. Look at the reclining figure in the middle. That we see her, the cloth, the clothing on this, we see the drapes and the fold on the clothing make it seem more naturalistic. Um, and then when we look at each individual figure, we see this individual expression. Now this is a turn from a lot of the medieval works. Medieval works usually have strong vertical and horizontal composition. We're not really worried about being realistic in them, so a lot of this detail, especially in the clothing um, and the wool of the sheep, that detail would be left out because that's not what was what was important. What was important is the message and the meaning. Yet here we can start to see Nicola start to shift. Now if you look at the work in the bottom right hand corner, we're going to see this even further shift. Now this is Giovanni Pisano, who was active circa 1250 to 1320. Um, he actually was Nicola's son, also a sculptor, and he created the pulpit for the Cathedral of Pisa, which I showed you on the previous slide. But what happens here is his works become even more realistic than his father's. This panel shows the same thing as the one above it. This is the Annunciation, Nativity, and Adoration of the Shepherds, 1302 to 1310. This one is also marble. It's 2 feet 10 and 3 eighths inches by 3 feet 7 inches. Now when you compare the two, 
Giovanni's work is even more lifelike. We see more movement with it. It doesn't seem quite as static. We see a lot of the vertical lines instead of some of the horizontal and verticals that are still, I've seen more diagonal lines, I'm sorry, than the horizontal and verticals that were in Nicola's. Especially look at Mary in the nativity. She is twisted. We actually almost see her completely in profile and we see her knee sticking up there. Again, he added more individualism and more expression and emotion in the faces. Now this is again something very new at this time period. Now we're also going to see this shift in painting. At this time, most painting is being done in what's called the Byzantine uh, tradition from the Byzantine Empire. What happens is when Rome falls, we go into the Middle Ages, we're going to see the rise of the Byzantine Empire in what's today known as like the modern or the Middle East. And what happens in Byzantine tradition and art is that we have very flat, unrealistic images. We pretty much have no attempt at perspective. And the purpose, again, is not to show things realistically, but it's the message and the meaning behind them, the iconography, meaning what it stands for. And we see this in this piece here. This is what's done in what's called the Italo-Byzantine style or the Manera Greca, meaning the Greek style. And basically, this is just how the Byzantine style was adapted in Italy. So this is the St. Francis altarpiece, 1235, uh, tempera on wood, 5 feet by 3 feet. And here we see St. Francis in the center, and he's surrounded by his attributes. Attributes meaning things that usually go along with him. Probably one of the most famous of St. Francis is the stigmata. The stigmata means these were the marks that Christ had on him when he was crucified, so the nail marks in his hands and his feet and the cut in his side. And one of the stories with St. Francis says that the moment basically like he knew his mission was accepted by the angels, the stigmata miraculously appeared on him. And so if you look at his hands and his feet in here, you can see that. Now when you look at this, this is, work is very, very flat. It's pretty much two-dimensional. And this is more of an example of traditional Byzantine art. Flat, frontal-facing figures, and again, the emphasis is on the spiritual nature. Now, if we shift the, to this work, this is by Chiba Bui, who was uh, active 1240 to 1302, and he was one of the first artists to break from the Byzantine style. And we see this in his works. This is the Madonna enthroned with angels and prophets, it's from the Santa Charita, which is in Florence. This is circa 1280 to 1290. It's tempera and gold leaf on wood. 12 feet 7 inches by 7 feet 4 inches. And what we can see here is there is a dramatic shift from the previous work here. Here we're seeing some attempts at three-dimensionality. Look at the throne Mary is sitting on, like the steps her feet are on, and then actually the seat. We see attempts at three-dimensionality. However, he really doesn't complete it. When you look at the top of the throne, it's still very flat. Also, Mary herself, we see her face turned more in profile. And what happens with this slight profile is it makes her look more naturalistic, especially, again, when we compare it to St. Francis here. Also, we see here the angels look a little more individualized, but we still do see some Byzantine influences. The use of gold leaf within the work. This is where gold literally is pounded out to very, very thin, flat pieces and is used in the work. And we still see in the medieval what's called stacking. Look at the angels um, along the sides of Mary's throne. Now, the person in the Middle Ages would understand they're not stacked on top of one another. We're supposed to see them as lined up beside her throne. Yet in the Middle Ages, to show this so you could fully see everyone, they would stack them in the artwork. And this is a very unrealistic representation. Think about when you're standing in a group of people. Who do you see best? The person in the front. The people in the back, you only see part of them. So within Chiabui's work, we do see some of this turn to a more representational. Um, we also see your textbook talks about Pietro Ca uh, Cavallini, circa 1240 to 1340. I don't have the images here. Now, he's considered the most important Roman painter of this time period. 
um, but unfortunately most of his works only survive in fragments. Now your textbooks talks about his frescoes on the walls of Santa Cecilia and Traverse Day in Rome. And here we again see these beginning attempts to make things more lifelike. In areas you can see he attempts to use perspective. The clothing is much more realistic. We see the folds and the shading. Same as we do here in Chio Bui's work. When you look at Madonna, you can actually see the folds in her clothes. But we also still see in his works, again, some of the more of the older influence. And his, just like this one, also contains the stacking of the angels. Well, now we're going to move into the Trecento, which is the 14th century, meaning 1300 to 1400. And now a little history. Um, again, we're talking about Italy, but Italy at this time period is not the unified Italy we think of now. Italy is made up of prosperous city-states and, again, is not a unified single country. In fact, many of these city-states were often in competition with each other. Also during this time period in the late 1340s, we have the outbreak of the Black Death or the Plague. And what happens in this, within five years, between 25 and 50 percent of the continent's population was wiped out. So this dramatically changed part of the artworks. Um, but what we're also going to see in the Trecento is we're going to see even more focus on the natural world. Now this isn't just going to be in the artworks that we're going to look at, we're also going to see this in the literature of the time. Usually up to this, this point, any type of literature was written in Latin, which was the official language of the church. But most people did not speak Latin. If you were in Italy, you spoke some form of Italian. Well, what happens during the Trecento is that people, authors, started switching to the vernacular, meaning the spoken language. And this made the works become more available to more people. Example of this is Dante's The Divine Comedy was written in Italian. And then the famous poet and writer Petrarch would also write in the vernacular. Also during this time period, we're going to see the Renaissance humanism begin to develop. And we'll talk about this more over the next couple chapters. But what happens with Renaissance humanism is this is a growing concern with the natural world, the individual, and then humanity's world existence. We begin at this time to see this rebirth of art and culture that's more influenced by ancient Greece and Rome and not necessarily just the church. This idea of humanism is it's almost a code of civil conduct. It's a theory of education and a scholarly discipline um, that encourages people to be educated and it looks at, looks at and values all human beings as having potential just because they are a human being. It starts to deny the idea that you are born into the class and position that you are meant to inhabit that people and individuals should be judged on their own merits. Now what we're also going to start to see at this time is human values and interests becomes more focused on and distinct from religion's otherworldly values. However, at this time we do not see this as opposing religion. Eventually we will eventually get there. What we're going to see here is the development of civic virtues meaning that more people are going to be involved in the state and the government, and that it's this idea of seeing the importance of the civic life, meaning life with others within the civilization, as more important over the individual wants and needs. Um, individuals are supposed to be self-sacrificing to the state, they're supposed to participate in government, and they're supposed to defend the state. And what we're going to see is a stoic indifference to personal misfortune, that there's this more concern of, well, it might not benefit me, but it's for the greater good. And this is something we're going to start to see develop at this time. We're going to start to see this shift from faith to reason, and we'll see this more so in the Renaissance. And we're going to see these ideas continue into the artwork. Now this is the work by Giotto. We already looked at the Arena Chapel before. Now Giotto, interesting enough, he has been called the most important artist of his time. Um, one of the scholars who called him that was Giorgio Vasari, 1511 to 1574. And Vasari is considered the father of art history. And he claimed that Giotto 
is the most significant and the most important artist of his time, and in fact that he is the father of Western pictorial art. Now many scholars think he was actually trained by Chimabui, but what we're going to see here follows along with the two previous slides. So what we're going to see here is his Madonna enthroned. Now this is from the altarpiece from All Saints Church in Florence, circa 1314, 1310, and it's a temperan gold leaf on wood. Now this one is 10 feet 8 inches by 6 feet 6 inches. And this one is even more realistic than the other ones. Here, his use of perspective on the throne makes it look completely three-dimensional. You can see the steps, but unlike the earlier work by Chimabui at the top, here, the top of his throne is also in perspective. Also, the clothing looks much more realistic. Again, we have the folds, the shaping, um, and the drooping cloth, but even more so underneath, you can actually detect Mary's body under her robe. And if you look at her chest area, you can actually see her breasts here underneath the, the garment. In the previous work, we really don't see that, right? We see the structure of the clothing, but we get no hint of the body underneath. Here in Giotto's work, we get a sense of the form underneath, and this is much more realistic. Also, you see a little bit of difference in the stacking here. There's still a little bit slight stacking of the angels, but we also see a more realistic perspective. So some of those that we can't see entirely, this is much more realistic. Now, many scholars see this point as the end of medieval painting in Italy and the beginning of the Renaissance. And then we're going to look at another work of Giotto's here. This is one of the frescoes from the Arena Chapel. This is Lamentation, 1305. It's six feet six and three fourths inches by six feet three fourths inches. Now, before we get into lamentation itself, I want to talk a little bit another about one of those sidebars, which talks about fresco painting. Fresco painting is very popular because it is very durable. Why? This is a technique where a painting is made on or actually in a wall. It's one of the most durable painting techniques because one fresco meaning true fresco, is where the paint is applied to a wet layer of plaster, which is known as the intaco. So when it dries, the paint literally becomes part of the wall. Now this is done in sections because the artist can only work while the plaster is wet. And what we see, this is called the giorni, which is Italian for days, and basically it just means that's the section the, the artist can work on that day while the plaster is still wet. So when you look at this work here, the lamentation, look up in the sky and you see these different sections where the blues are different. That's the different giornates because that means that's all he could work at on that specific day. And we can see very clearly he couldn't quite match the blues perfectly. All right. Oh, and before we move on, there's also what's called fresco secco. And this is dry fresco. This is not as durable. This is when we have the lime plaster wall is dry and then the painting is done on the wall. It does not physically become part of it and over time it can flake off. All right, well now looking at the arena chapel, um, a little more detail than we got into earlier. Now the arena chapel is also known as the Scriveni Chapel. It was, it was painted between 1305 and 1306. It's known as the Arena Chapel because the building literally is right next to Arena, which is a track. Or it's the Scrivini Chapel because its patron was an Enrico Scrivini. Now what Enrico was trying to do with this is his family got their money because his father was a usury or a money lender. And what usury was, was it was the practice of loaning money to people at very, very exorbitant interest rates. And this was actually seen as a sin. In fact, Scriveni's father is mentioned in Dante's The Inferno, meaning he's in hell. Um, and he's in hell pu being punished for this, uh, for this usury. And so what Scriveni was trying to do was there was this idea he could kind of make up for the sins of his father and himself for being in the money lending business. And so he hired Giotto to paint the arena chapel, and he almost offered it up as a kind of gift 
to the gods or to God to probably to try to pave his way into heaven. In fact, if you look in the arena chapel over the front door, there's a painting of Scriveni on his knees, literally holding a small re a replica of the arena chapel, offering it to the angels. Well, the arena chapel, the entire room is painted. And if you look on the first slide, uh, there's a clip there, a YouTube clip. That'll take you to a short video from the Khan Academy. And this is nice because it shows you around the entire chapel. What we have in here are 38 framed panels that show the life of Mary and the life of Jesus. Also, we have different images of the virtues and the vices, which are painted in Griselle, which is a monotone gray. They are painted this way, so they appear as sculptures. And many of the architectural elements are also painted. They are a type of an illusion. So what we're looking at within Lamentation here is we see even more naturalism. What this moment is, this is the moment where Christ has already been crucified and he's been taken down from the cross. So you see the fallen Christ near the bottom and you see that his mother Mary is holding him and then Mary Magdalene is by his feet. And then there's different people around and they're all in mourning. Here what we're seeing is again, we're seeing a more realistic use of perspective and we see the strong diagonal line. Follow kind of the rock outcropping from the, the back right and it diagonally goes down. And then we even have Christ's form. We don't see all of it. We actually, it makes it look um, how we see the backs of two of the mourners. It makes it appear as if we are actually even voyeurs looking in on the scene. Here, there is no stacking. People who are in the back, we can barely see them. And there's more of a use of natural light and shade from a single steady source. Now, this use of light and shade is done to make works appear more realistic. And this is that idea of the chiaroscuro. Also, we see each of the individuals with their own expressions, including the angels. The angels in the sky are twisted and turned in anguish. And again, this is something very different from the medieval works. All right, continuing on, we are going to look at some specific city-states and the art in them. The first is Siena. The Siena was, um, Siena was a republic city-state in Italy, and it was ruled by a group of men called the Nine. And what happens with the Nine is that every two months they are re-elected, so it's kind of a republic government. Well, probably the most famous artist from Siena is Duccio. He was active 1278 to 1318. And what we're seeing here, he was considered the best artist of Siena at this time period. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at the Maesta altarpiece. This was what, um, the altarpiece in Siena Cathedral. It started in 1308 and was finished in 1311. Now what you're looking at here is just the central panel. It was a massive work in its entirety, but now it's been broken up um, into different pieces. Altogether, it was over 13 feet high with the central panel with seven pinnacles above and a parallel below, which is a shelf. And so here on this slide, you can see the top left is the front, and then the bottom right was the back of it with many, many different images on it. But for right now, we're going to focus on the central panel, which is the virgin and child enthroned with saints. This is also tempera and gold leaf on wood, and this is 7 feet by 13 inches. I'm sorry, feet. 7 feet by 13 feet. Here you can still see the Byzantine influence, but it's much more relaxed. The figures are not frontal or, real, or rigid. We see the individual faces. And then the solid outlines, very traditional of the Byzantine works, have been softened here. Now, this does adhere to some of the Byzantine traditions because Duccio knew the purpose of the altarpiece was a place of worship in the cathedral and that it should be a holy object, meaning the most important part about it, again, was the holy message and not just the artistic expression within it. Now, the back of the altarpiece shows various narrative scenes um, from the Annunciation of Jesus' birth to Mary, and it ends with the res resurrection. And on this, there are various, the various scenes are shown in 46 different panels. 
And so here we'll focus on one of these. This is the portrayal of Jesus from the back panel. Um, and this was one feet, ten and a half inches by three feet, four inches. And what's interesting here is more than on the front altarpiece, we see even more of this realism in the work. And here there's actually three different scenes. If you look on the left, you see Peter cutting off the priest's ear. In the center, we have the betrayal of Jesus. This is shown by Judas's kiss. And on the right, we see the disciples fleeing in terror. Now again, much more realistic. We see again the use of perspective, the detailing in the cloth, the lack of stacking here, except on the right, there's a little bit of stacking. Um, but this is much more realistic and natural than the front of the, of the altarpiece. And again, we also see more of the emotion in this work. You know, St. Peter cutting off the ear, he's angry. The kiss of Judas is the betrayal, and then the fear of the fleeing disciples. Another famous artist from Siena is Simone Martini, um, active 1285 to 1344. Now, he was a pupil of Duccio, and he is what we um, of, um, an artist in what's called the International Gothic Style. And this was a style, you still see the Byzantine influences, but it was also um, influenced by Gothic art, which was very um, popular in France. Here we're going to see radiant colors, fluttering lines, a sense of weightlessness, elongated figures, and a spaceless setting. And what we're looking at here is this is the Annunciation from the, salt, the altar of St. Ansys in Siena Cathedral, 1333, tempera and gold leaf on wood on wood and this is the center panel now the moment we're seeing here is the angel gabriel has just arrived if you look he's the second figure on the left and we know he has just arrived because his robe is actually still billowing out below him mary demorally shrinks away from him uh, her face kind of looks nowadays when i think she's like Ugh, not interested but this is supposed to to show that you know she's She's kind of a little bit afraid of him, and she kind of is, you know, shying away and showing reverence to him. And this would be proper at the time. Now, the flowers in between them are actually white lilies, which show Mary's purity. Now, within this, we have the idea that the scene subordinates drama to court ritual and structural experimentation to surface splendor. And so within this, we do see some of those hints of the Byzantine we do see some of this attempts at realisticness, but it also has that gothic influence to it. Now here is something that is decidedly different. This is Pietro Lorenzetti's. Um, he was active 1280 to 1348, and he was also a pupil of Duccio's. And what we're going to see here is a lot more realism in the work. This is the birth of the Virgin, meaning the birth of Mary, from the altar of St. Savinus in the Siena Cathedral. This is 1342, also tempera on wood, but no gold leaf. And what we see here is more realism in the works, and especially within this one, we see the realism based on the architecture. So if you look here, this is what's called a triptych, meaning it's in three different pieces. A lot of times these could be folded up. So those white columns that Pietro has actually painted into the work, that's where the three pieces are connected. And he's doing this very realistically because if you look at the figure in red kneeling at the at um, uh, Sarah, her mother, Anne, I'm sorry, Anne's her mother, her side, is that it's partially hidden behind this pillar. And then the left one is made used to create the wall. Here we see this use of perspective and three-dimensionality within the work, again, to give it a much more realistic idea. All right, well, in Siena, Siena claims its foundation myth is that it was founded by Sinius and Ascius, who were the sons of Remus. Now, the myth claims that they stole the shrine of the, of the she-wolf she in Rome from Romulus. If you remember the twins, Romulus and Remus, supposedly were raised by the she-wolf, and they are the founding uh, founders of Rome. Well, what happens is supposedly the sons of Remus steal the, tr the shrine of the she-wolf from Romulus, they settle in Siena, and then the city is named after Sinius, one of the sons. In 1260, 
the city dedicated itself to the Virgin Mary, and they saw Mary as the protectress against natural disasters and human aggression. Um, by the 13th century, the Republic was dominated by merchants and bankers. And what we're going to look at is what's called the Palazzo Publico, which was the city hall. This was located near the cathedral complex, and it shows this balance of government in the church. And it shows this is represented by their heights that are actually almost equal on the skylight. It is built of brick, marble columns, and Gothic arches. The bell tower in the city center is very tall. In fact, it's even taller than the one in Florence. And the design suggests that power flowed reciprocally from the citizenry to their respective government. The government controlled the design and, the regulate, and regulated the design of buildings surrounding it. Um, in front of it, there is the compo area, and this hosted meetings of the public body, public religious fests, and sporting events. Well, what we're going to look at now is we're going to look at Ambrigio Lorenzetti's uh, frescoes within the Palazzo Publico. Uh, Ambrigio was active 1290 to 1348, and he was actually Pietro's younger brother. And so what we're looking at here, these are in the Sala della Pace, which means the Hall of Peace. And there was a series of three frescoes that were created. The Allegory of Good Government, which was the central wall and the focal point of the room, which we're looking at here. There was the effects of good government in the city and the country, and bad government and the effects of bad government in the city. So what happens is Embrigo was commissioned in 1338. Now this room, it's very important, it was the meeting room of the nine, meaning the group of men who ruled the Sienese government. Um, they actually, in fact, ruled the Republic from 1287 to 1355. And so th those in the room were responsible for the ordering and the reformation of the whole city and the cantado, which means the countryside. And so what happens in these frescoes is Lorenzetti paints them to show what happens to an area that is ruled by a good government and then an area that is ruled by the bad government. Now first here what you're seeing this is the allegory of good government. The central figure is usually seen. Uh, it's that large male figure. He's dressed in the colors of Siena, black and white, and the CSCV above his head stands for the Sienese Commune, the City of the Virgin. He's surrounded by six female virtues and three winged figures, who are faith, hope, and charity. Here it shows the state manifests an idea of Christian virtue. Within this, civil and moral law come together in the image, and concord is the natural result of governance whose structure is visualized. And we see this. When you see these row of individuals, the people lined up two by two are the citizens. So from this well-structured, balanced government, you see here, right, between the leader and the church, we see this balance, well, not even the church, the idea of virtue coming together, that we have this happy working government. We see the same idea in the effects of good government in the city and in the country. Here we see the good government in the city. It shows the thriving city and the countryside. In fact, in the city in the middle here, you can see people together dancing. Um, we see prosperous trade. We see uh, houses and buildings being constructed. So life here is good. Now, this is the peaceful countryside. In fact, the figure of security in the top left hovers above the hills, promising safety to all under the rule of law. And interestingly enough, in her outstretched left hand, she actually holds a model of a gallows with a hanged criminal, kind of warning to those, if you're not going to follow the rule of law, this is what's going to happen to you. Now, this painting is considered mainly secular, meaning it has very little religious connotation um, to it. Now, the other fresco within this is the bad government and the effects of bad government in the city. Now, unfortunately, after a time period, uh, people saw this as disturbing, and a lot of the fresco was destroyed. That's where you're going to see these blank spots, and especially more so when you see bad government in the city here. 
Well, what happens here is who is the central figure throne is you have a devious looking figure. He's adorned with horns, fangs, and he's actually cross-eyed. And this is often identified as tyranny. He sits on a throne, resting his feet upon a goat, which was a symbol of luxury. And in his hand, he actually holds a dagger. Below him, captive at his feet, actually you can see the figure of justice is literally bound. While the figures of cruelty, deceit, fraud, fury, division, and war flank him, and he also has the three figures floating above him, but in this one, instead of being faith, hope, and charity, here they are Arvis, pride, and vainglory. These figures, according to an advice book for the city magistrates of the time, were considered to be the leading enemies of human life. And so what happens in this, and then we see in the city here, this city remarkably different than the other one. We actually see somebody being murdered. Um, the city itself, the buildings are in disarray. There's fires. And so the idea behind this is it's to remind the nine, the rulers, that what happens under a good government and what can happen under a bad government. All right. Next, we're going to switch to Florence. Florence was a rival of Siena, and we'll talk about Florence a lot more in the following chapters because Florence is seen as the, begin, uh, the city of the Renaissance. Um, Florence at this time controlled the textile industry. In fact, its gold florin was the standard gold coin of exchange everywhere in Europe, and Florence to this day is still known for its gold shops. Well, what you're looking at here is the Florence Cathedral, the Santa Maria della Fiore, which is St. Mary of the Flowers, or it's also known as the Duomo, which is cathedral in Italian. This is a massive, massive structure, and it's meant to show the greatness of Florence. The Campani, or the Bell Tower, which you can see on the left, um, was designed by Giotto in 1334, and it actually stands on its own. Both the cathedral and the Capani, the bell tower, wish to show clear, logical composition. And this building was meant to dominate the skyline, to show the center and the strength of Florence. All right, well then just very briefly, we're going to talk about Pisa. Pisa was a port city, and the text focuses just on works that concern death at this time. And as I said earlier, death became a significant theme in art even before the plague, but it continued more so after. And so what we see here, this is part of Triumph in Depth. Now this was a massive fresco which was located in the Caposanto in, in Pisa. This is a graveyard. And so what we see here, this is just a small section. The full fresco is 18 feet 6 inches by 49 feet 2 inches. And what we see here, this is the actual one, and then I'm going to show you this one because it's a little easier to see. This is basically a restored version of it. And what happens, this was painted in the 1330s, and this section is where writers discover three corpses. And here what we see, it captures the horrors of death, and it forces viewers to confront their own mortality. In the work we see again this realism in the emotion. And here you can see the three different corpses are in various states of decomposition. The people are kind of horrified, yet the animals and the dogs, because of the smell, are quite interested. Now the second section here, again this is the unrestored version, is it shows those who are unprepared for death. Usually those who are unprepared are seen as wealthy and living in their luxury. In fact, the scene here, you can see the individuals in the front right. They're feasting in an orange grove, listening to music. And the idea was, if you're unprepared, when you go to, to die, you need to be prepared, meaning you need to um, have, uh, excuse me, meaning you need to have asked forgiveness for your sins. And if you're unprepared, then it's very likely you won't achieve salvation. And if you look in the sky here, it's actually full of angels and demons who are struggling for the souls of the dead. Alright, next, very briefly, we're going to look at Venice. Venice was one of the wealthiest city-states in late medieval Italy, and Venice is often known for its streets of water.
All right, here we see the Doge's palace, and this is actually the seat of government. The Doge was the ruler. Um, it's likened to a duke. And this is situated on the Grand Canal. Construction was begun around 1340 to 35, and it was remodeled after 1424. Here we see a lot of the Gothic influence. When you see the first, um, first level, we see the Gothic pointed arches. These are doubled in the second level, and we see the pierced quatrefoils and the slender columns. This also represents the late Gothic architecture. And what's interesting is each upper level is actually taller than the one below it. In fact, the third level is almost the same height as the first level and the second level um, combined. And again, this is supposed to show the greatness of the seat of the rule. All right, well, that concludes this chapter. Again, the reason why we discuss it is we're starting to see this shift from the medieval works into the Renaissance works, which are going to focus more on realism, naturalism, and individualism in the works.